Good morning. Thank you, Tom, for your kind words of welcome. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate the trust of both you and the leadership here at Countryside Bible Churches. We like to call it Kindred East. Um, and, but uh, as Tom has outlined, we've enjoyed a friendship for many years. And uh, Sheila is a blessing alongside of Tom. And so uh, when invited to come to Countryside, I don't pray very long. I just assume it's God's will and I start packing my, my uh, bags. It's um, a joy to be alongside uh, two of God's choice servants, Dr. H.B. Charles, who I haven't met in person, but whose writing and preaching ministry has enriched and benefited me. And then Steve Lawson, uh, who has been a friend for many, many years. I love the subject we are looking at this weekend, um, our, our living eternal hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, the thought of heaven. In fact, when I got off the airplane in uh, uh, DFW, uh, someone asked me what I was doing in Dallas, and I told them I was coming to Countryside to preach on a series on heaven. And they said, you know what, uh, do, do you realize that all Aggies are going to heaven? I said, I said, how do you know that? He says, because they never reach the age of accountability. <laughs> That's terrible. Sorry, sorry. I had to just pass that on uh, from some longhorn over at DFW. Um, but but I, I, love the, I love the theme um, because the study of heaven is uh, something we should be engaged in. Number one, because uh, there's a lot of material in the Bible on the future. Some 28% of the Bible is prophetic in nature, and a lot of it centering on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm interested in the future because I'm going to live there. And God has something to say about that. The Bible has a lot to say about the future, the eternal state, heaven, uh, and, and the Bible doesn't want us to be ignorant. 1 Thessalonians 4, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Paul wanted the church at Thessalonica to know the state of departed loved ones who were in the immediate presence of Jesus Christ and who would return with him at the rapture. And then thirdly, we should be studying heaven, not only because there's a ton of material um, in the Bible about it, not only because God doesn't want us to be ignorant of our glorious future, but, but thirdly, heaven isn't just a final destination, heaven is a present orientation. Steve touched on that, so did HB last night, Colossians 3, set your faction on things above, right? Um, we are citizens of heaven, and we, we wait eagerly for Jesus' return. Heaven has already begun in us. We have been born again, or as the Greek says, born from above. God's already at work in us. The kingdom is within and we thank God for that. It was said of um, Richard Sibbs, the Puritan, uh, that blessed man had heaven in him before he was in heaven. And I hope that across this weekend, that will be the outcome, that we will appreciate afresh that heaven is in us before we are in heaven. So take your Bible and uh, turn to Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 to 5. Now, I'm going to be a little bit more topical this morning. Uh, that doesn't mean I won't be expositional. It just means I won't be sequential. We're kind of going to hop, skip, and jump across several biblical passages because I want to deal with the issue, what will we do in heaven? I called the message in a series I did at our church, Plenty to Do. There'll be plenty to do in heaven. And we find um, aspects of that in Revelation 22, verses 1 to 5. You're going to see in this text, and they'll become the jumping off point for other thoughts that indeed uh, we will uh, see and see for God, we will minister and serve before Him, and we will reign forever. Follow along. I'm reading from the New King James translation of Holy Scripture. Revelation 22 verses 1 to 5, and he showed me a pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. 
and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So he reads God's word. We pray that the Spirit of God will attend upon it with power and illumination. Death is no laughing matter, but there are certain epitaphs and tombstones that are rather hilarious. I've gathered some over the years. Here's a sample of them. Here lies John Yeast. Pardon me for not rising. Here lies Uncle Ned. We find his body, but not his head. Rest in peace, Cousin Hewitt. We all know you didn't do it. Here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, who stepped on the gas instead of the brake. Here lies Baron Vickers, died October 10th, 1887, second fastest draw in Austin. (laughs) Uh, Here's a nameless headstone. Faults I may have, but being wrong was not one of them. There's another nameless headstone. I told you I was sick. But here's my favorite. Uh, Here's my favorite. Here lies a poor woman who always was tired, for she lived in a place where help wasn't hired. Her last words on earth were, dear friends, I am going where washing ain't done, nor sweeping, nor sewing. And everything there is exact to my wishes, for where they don't eat, there's no washing of dishes. Don't weep for me now, don't weep for me ever, for I'm going to do nothing forever and ever. (laughs) Now, Now, joking aside, that last headstone epitaph is a good reminder of the bad ideas that we attach and latch to the idea of life after life or heaven itself. It's not uncommon for people to think of heaven in terms of inactivity, boredom, repetition. Heaven is often presented as one long, tedious, never-ending church service, not for those who don't like singing. Heaven is a repeated victim of the caricature that its inhabitants are presented as angelic winged creatures reclining on white puffy clouds strumming harps. Heaven has suffered from caricatures. In fact, here's a caricature from Joel Stein, columnist at the LA Times. Heaven is totally overrated. It seems boring. Clouds listening to people play the harp. There we go again. It should be somewhere you can't wait to go, like a luxury hotel. Maybe the blue skies and the soft music were enough to keep people in line in the 17th century, but heaven has to step it up a bit. They're basically getting by because they're only a little bit better than hell. Hmm. Here's another caricature, George Bernard Shaw the Irish poet, heaven as conventionally conceived is a place so inane, so dull, so useless, so miserable that nobody has ever ventured to describe a whole day in heaven. But we're going to fix that this morning. Don't worry about that. Though plenty of people have described the day at the seaside. So all of that said, here's my goal, my task, my passion in this sermon is to counter and crush that caricature of heaven. There is plenty to do in heaven. And we're going to hop, skip, and jump across the biblical text and show you, if time allows me, eight things that you and I will do in heaven. There's plenty to do in heaven. Number one, if you're taking notes, life in heaven will be marked by stopping. Life in heaven will be marked by stopping. Revelation 14, verse 13, the context is the great tribulation. The verse is focused on those who are martyred during the tribulation period and who enter heaven. And here's what we read. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest, underline that word, rest from their labors and their work shall follow them. This text is telling us that we will rest in heaven. That's one of the things we will do in heaven. We will rest. Now, that's not the same as putting your feet up for all eternity. 
We're not talking here about a cessation of activity. We're not encouraging idleness in this text. This text isn't inviting you when you get to heaven to hit the snooze button. Because we'll come back to another thought from Revelation 22 verse 3 that his servants will serve him. So whatever this means, it isn't rest from serving. It isn't rest from activity. It isn't rest from worshiping and ministering before the Lord. I think there's a couple of angles. Number one, I think it's a reflecting and a taking stock of what we have done and what we have accomplished for the Lord. That's how the word is used, isn't it, with regards to our great God in Genesis 2-2, that on the seventh day, God ceased from all that he had done and rested from all that he had done. That doesn't mean God was inactive, right? He's upholding all things at all times by the word of his power, even when he's resting. He's always working all things out after the counsel of his own will. So what does that word rest in Genesis 2, 2 mean? It means that he was reflecting on his work and it was very good. He was looking over what he had done and what he had accomplished. And I think that's one of the thoughts we can tie to Revelation 14, 13. They will rest from their labors. Here's the question. What will you and I be looking back on? Those martyred in the tribulation will be looking back on their sacrificial suffering service for Jesus Christ, ending in spilt blood. What will you and I be looking back on? Hopefully you've got a resume of service for Jesus Christ. Hopefully you've determined what those good works that God has ordained for you to do are, and you're doing them. Ephesians 2 verse 10. Hopefully you're striving each and every day and each and every hour to hear that well done, good and faithful servant. So when we get to heaven, we want to be able to look back on what we have done for God and be able to say in some measure, good. And hear his well done, good and faithful servant. Let's always be abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not vain. I love Romans 12, verse 11, right? Don't be lacking in diligence. Be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. There's coming a night when no man shall work. Jesus was aware of that, pushed him forward. I hope you're aware of that. I hope that every morning you get up, you remind yourself, there's coming a night when no man will work. I got to be busy. I got to put my hand to the ply. If I've got a business, I'm going to run it ethically. I'm going to bring my children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. I'm going to keep myself as a single, sexually pure in an unclean world. I'm going to serve my local church with my spiritual gifts to the best of my ability, imparted by the Holy Spirit. Amy Carmichael, missionary to India, who heals from my native Belfast. In fact, I preached in the hall in Belfast that sent her out. She once said this, we have all of eternity to celebrate our victories, but only a short time to win them. And we're in that window, my friend. But I think there's another angle to this idea of stopping or resting. I think it speaks of the end of the battles and the struggles that come with living a godly life. Don't forget the text we read here in Revelation 14, 13, uh, that, that they will rest from their labors. We're talking about tribulation saints. We're talking about martyrs for Jesus Christ. The context is martyrdom. And so the rest we're talking about, no doubt, is a rest concerning the battles and the struggles to live godly in a godless world. In this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Acts 14, 22, through much tribulation, we will enter the kingdom of God. You know this, but can I remind you, if you're a little discouraged this morning, don't be surprised, the road to heaven is a rough one. It's bumpy. It's a narrow road. We've got to strive to enter in and walk in the Spirit. 
It's a wonderful thing to contemplate a day when we will no longer struggle with indwelling sin and surrounding sinners. Amen? That's going to be a beautiful day when we don't struggle with indwelling sin and surrounding sinners. In fact, Paul encouraged the Thessalonians, didn't he, in the context of 2 Thessalonians 1, talking about uh, the, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in power and glory. And he talks about that in the context of rest. Listen to these words, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-7. In fact, let's back up into verse 5 which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be accounted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, since it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when Jesus is revealed from heaven. So, so I think the rest is looking back at the resume of our work for Jesus Christ, and hopefully it, it, it's, you know, Gold and silver and precious stones, not wood, hand, stubble. The quality of it will withstand the judgment seat of Christ and we will enter into our reward. But there's coming a beautiful day when we will leave behind us the struggles and the trials and the tears of this earth and the Christian life. Richard Baxter, English preacher, was told by his doctors early in his 30s that he wouldn't see a long life. And so from that moment, he was kind of living under a sentence of death. In fact, he didn't expect to reach his next birthday. And, and that prognosis caused him to, to think more intently about eternal life and the future. And so he covenanted with himself to spend 30 minutes a day meditating on the subject of heaven. And he practiced that until he was 76. <laughs> Doctors can get it wrong once in a while. But the fruit of it ultimately was a 700-page book called The Saints Everlasting Rest. And when you read the book, he talks about rest from the devil's attention and attacks. Rest from the opposition of an alien culture. Rest from fighting temptation of any kind. Rest from pain and sorrow in the effects of sin. Rest from doubts and fears and conflicts of conscience. Rest from the disciplines of grace and sanctification. No wonder John says, even so come, Lord Jesus. Talking about a Puritan, William Gurnall, who wrote a great work on the Christian's armor and spiritual warfare, he caught a vision of what I'm talking about here when he said, I expect to lay down my sword and life together. Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's progress, he's got a sword held high crossing the river of death to the very gates of heaven. Number two, life in heaven would be marked by solving, not just stopping and resting, but solving having our questions answered. There'll be a solving of the riddles of God's dark providences in our lives. For this, I go to 1 Corinthians 13 and uh, verses 11 and, and 12. Let me read them for you. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things for now. Right now, in this present world, we see in a mirror dimly. But then, the eternal state would be my take on that, or certainly a good argument could be made for that. That would be my, possibly the meaning of the, the, the perfect that is to come. In fact, when we get to Revelation 22, we'll see God's face. I think we're dealing here with the eternal state. Now we know in part, then we shall know just as we are known. Heaven is a place where question marks are straightened out to exclamation marks. Heaven in the perfect state will allow us a fuller understanding of God and therefore His ways. I think we're all painfully aware, if you've lived long enough, that his ways are sometimes not our ways. We didn't sign up for it. It doesn't make any sense from where we stand, from where we sit, and what we feel, and what we experience. But his ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, right? Roman, it's, 
Isaiah 55, 8 to 9, and then you've got Romans 11, 33. His ways are past finding out. His ways are inscrutable. Don't try and unscrew them. Give yourself a headache. But you see, Paul seems to be inferring there's coming a day when we all have a deeper and a greater and a wider knowledge of God and His ways. In this context, we're dealing with revelatory gifts, temporary or permanent. Paul admits to whatever degree God has revealed His will. We, we, we have a, a, a knowledge of God, partial, although sufficient. But what we know of God isn't through all there is to know of God. And, and he draws kind of two analogies to convey that, the, the, the contrast between the child and the adult. Okay, there's a great difference in knowledge between a, a you know, a, a three or a four-year-old who's learning their two times tables and a 30-year-old man who's just graduated with a PhD. And Paul says, we, when I was a child, I thought as a child when I became a man, I put those things away. And, and progressively, that is what we'll experience in our walk with God. And, the, and right now, we're looking into a mirror dimly. This morning, you probably looked in a mirror. I try to avoid them. They tend to crack when I look in them. But, but, but they looked into a burnished bronze piece of metal, which was dim, give them a, a kind of outline, but it was often distorted and shaded. And Paul's kind of taken that and said, that's how life and our understanding of it and God's providence was in it is right now, but there's coming a perfect state, a more perfected state, when um, we will, you know, get to a place where we see things more clearly. I know it's, it's not dealing with the eternal state, but I think we can take the words of Jesus in John 13 and verse 7 and apply them to other aspects of life. Remember when he was washing the disciples' feet and they were, uh, you know, not understanding why he was doing it? And Jesus said, what? What I do now, you don't understand, but you will understand hereafter with a reference to his death and, and resurrection. And I think we can lay that over life. And I, and I think uh, that will um, come back as a thought when we enter into God's presence and God explains later what he's doing now. I don't have time to go here, but you want to write down Revelation 7, 14 to 17. In that passage, you read again of the tribulation saints that he wipes away their tears. I think it would be a mistake. I think it would be a shallow uh, interpretation to read that text simply to mean that from that point forward, we don't cry again. Certainly has that. But I think it's a wiping away of the tears and the sorrows of life with explanations thrown in. Why God allowed us to cry. And high and high, we will never cry again. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said that when we get to heaven, the first two words that will come out of our mouths are the words, of course. I like that thought. I hope it's true. I think there are lines of revelation that would point us in that direction. Then face to face, the mirror dimly behind us, a greater understanding of God's dark providences in our lives. Let me squeeze this in. I pastor a church that was pastored by a, a man, Chuck Obrimsky, who died um, in the prime of life. He was the chaplain to the Anaheim, the Anaheim Ducks, the, the, the Angels, and the L.A. Rams at the time. He had all the sports in, in L.A. and Orange County locked up. He had a growing church at Kenwood Community Church, felt the lump in his leg. Before you know it, he's got cancer, and he won't live out many more months. He was once interviewed on TBN because he was well known in our area. He was actually interviewed by Paul Crouch, Crouch, who couldn't understand his peace in the sovereignty of God and that God hadn't healed this choice servant of God. And so live on broadcast, he said, Chuck, do you ever ask why? To which Chuck Obrimsky replied, no. 
Because what's the point? Um, God's ways are past finding out, and the answer to the why will come later. He says, Paul, I don't ever ask why, I ask what. Lord, what do you want to do with what I'm dealing with? And while we wait for the solving, let's ask God when we go through those tough times, what? Lord, what do you want to do through this, through me, for your glory? Number three, we will be studying. We will be studying. Got to speed up here. Piggybacking off the last thought, in heaven, we will be studying Habakkuk 2.14, dealing with the millennium. Talks about that God's knowledge and glory will fill the earth as the waters fill the sea. The age to come will include an ever-expanding understanding of God and His ways. Let me give you two other verses that I think are quite beautiful. Uh, Ephesians 2, right? where we have the past, the present, and the future of the believer. Our past, dead in sin. Our present, made alive in Jesus Christ. Our future, well, we'll read these verses 6 and 7. We've been raised up together and made to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, He might show. The Greek word there is reveal, make manifest, draw back the curtains, Open the windows. In the ages to come, he's going to show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. Stopping, that's what we'll be doing. Solving, that's what we'll be doing. Studying, that's what we will be doing. In heaven, we will happily study God and the new world that we inhabit Heaven and the new earth will be places of constant learning and ever-expanding horizons of knowledge and discovery. The new world will be marked by an insatiable childlike curiosity with regards to God and eternal life, right? John 17, 3, what is eternal life? To know God, the, the true God. We will spend the gift of eternal life, getting to know the God who gave us the gift of eternal life. More and more, more about Jesus would I know, and more of His grace to others show. Because we will be with God, and God is infinite, we will never come to an end of exploring Him. Maybe one verse or two verses to underline that, Ephesians 3.18 here on earth, we, as the church, gather to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of His love, right? The height of it that someday He'll take us to the Father's house, the depth of it that Jesus Christ humbled Himself and added humanity to His deity and came in the likeness of man in the form of a servant. Amazing. God manifest in flesh, the invisible God made visible, the ancient of days, born in time, head scratching. Throughout history, men have tried to be God. Only one gospel preaches God became man. The breadth of it, every tribe and tongue, the length of it, He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the earth. He has loved us with an eternal love. We're going to spend eternity measuring the dimensions of God's love in the gospel. With regards to the new world, we will marvel again and again at at, at God's handiwork, creativity, wisdom, and might as we explore the sights and the sounds of a regenerated planet. Let's go back to Revelation 21 and 22 quickly and just watch these these verbs of, of attraction and attention. 21 verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, come look, come see, come inquire. Verse 5, behold, I make all things new. 
Verse 9, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled the seven last plagues came to me and said, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. 22 verse 1, and he showed me a pure river. Verse 7, but behold, I come quickly is the words of Christ to his church. See him again, verse 12, behold, I come quickly. There's a lot of sights and signs, isn't there? In Revelation 21 and 22. And just as this world intrigues us, and we get caught up with the thought as Piper and others and Edwards talk about this world and this universe being a theater of God's glory, and we still see it even fallen, what's the new heaven and the new earth going to be like? Come, behold, see, look. We're going to spend eternity New, with new songs to sing, new places to visit, new joys to discover, new truths to treasure. Eureka moments in the new world will make the thrill of our newest technological toil, toy or thrill on earth pale in comparison. I remember Dr. MacArthur shared a story at one of the board meetings that Tom and I had been at about Robert Soce, who taught for year, uh, many years at Talbot uh, Theological Seminary, wrote a wonderful book on progressive dispensation. I think Tom gave me a copy of that many, many years ago. But anyway, uh, uh, John MacArthur said that one day Robert Soce said, John, I could never be a pastor because I could never make my mind up by Saturday night. I love that thought. Well, because the pastor's under the gun. We come to a passage of Scripture, and we've got, you know, so many hours in the week to wrestle the t- with the text and rightly divide it and plumb the depths of God's mind, heart, and glory revealed in, in Scripture. Got to get it done by Saturday night. Got to work out Ephesians 1 by Saturday night. Ooh. <laughs> Romans 9, 10, and 11. Whoa. Well, you know what? Robert says he's going to enjoy eternity because he'll have Saturday night and Sunday night and Monday morning and Wednesday afternoon to wrestle with the wisdom and the glory of God. Number four, we will be serving. Heaven will be marked by serving. That's our text, Revelation 22, verse 3, and there will be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants will serve him. Heaven and the new earth is not some super-duper version of the village's retirement community in Florida. (laughs) We're going to work. We're going to serve. We're going to minister. Remember, we qualified what the word rest meant. It doesn't mean we're not going to serve. We're going to look back on what we did on earth. And hopefully we have a resume that passes the judgment of Christ and we'll rest from that struggle. But we're going to serve him because work was part of the first Eden and it'll be part of the second Eden, paradise restored. I don't have time to take you through the book of Revelation, but it begins in chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ to his servants. This is a book written for servants and service. We're a kingdom of priests, verse 6, chapter 1. What about Revelation 7, verse 15? Uh, um, It talks about his servants serving him night and day before his throne. And here we are in Revelation 22, verse 3. Work has always been part of God's plan for people. We were made in the image of a working God. Remember what Jesus said, my father works. So I must do the works of him that sent me for the night comes when no man will work. The first Adam was not given a hammock and a pillow. He was given a shovel and a rake and put to work. I think it was Wingley, the Swiss reformer, who said "There's, there's nothing in the universe so like God as the worker. And heaven will resign and the new Jerusalem will resign, and the new earth will resign to the hum of industry. The new Jerusalem will be a working city where we will be given spheres of responsibility 
which would be my next thought, but I'm just going to leave it because I'm rolling it in this. Next thought would have been we will be supervising because one of the thoughts is reigning with Christ, and he mentions that a few times in his letters to the churches. But I'm going to kind of roll that idea for the sake of time into this idea that heaven will resign to the perpetual hum of industry, the new Jerusalem will be a working city. You and I will have responsibilities and daily vocations. H.B. said last night, Titus 2.14, that one of the redemptive purposes of Jesus Christ was to create for himself and produce a people zealous for good works. And that will, that will be true in the life to come. In fact, speaking about Revelation 7 verse 15 where they serve him night and day, Augustus H. Strong suggests that on heaven's door, these words will be inscribed, no admission except on business. And I thank God the futility and the frustration that comes with work on a fallen planet subject to futility will be taken out of the way. Our work life and the life to come will be utterly fulfilling maybe even fun. There'll be no Monday morning blues. We will want to work alongside the Creator Himself. We will work cooperatively without exhaustion, failure, and the dreaded sense of a negative pressure. We will approach work with the same joy and passion we bring to our favorite pastime or sport. Now, we're not told specifically what that looks like. It will include supervising, as I've said, but my best guess would be it, it will be what the, the creation mandate was in the old creation, to subdue the earth and to become a co-regent with God and, and, and subdue the earth and develop the creation reflecting God's glory. In fact, the Reformed theologian Hokema says this, the cultural mandate because of sin was never fully carried out the way God intended, so the new earth will allow us to finally and fully fulfill that mandate to subdue the earth and, and, and to cultivate what God has created. God's the creator, and, and, and uh, we are the cultivators alongside of Him. One writer speaking about the age to come says that in life in the Garden of Eden serves as a template of what we can expect in heaven. In the beginning, God created nature and called it good. But God intended his image bearers to cultivate nature, to work it, create something very good. For example, cherries are good, cherry pie, even better. <laughs> Avocados are good, but guacamole, even better. Tomatoes and spices, good. Salsa, even better. You get the point. You take what God has created and you cultivate it for His glory and your enjoyment. And that's going to be what we will do forever and ever and ever in an ever-expanding capacity. One day, the great artist Leonardo da Vinci was hard at work on a canvas. He toiled on it for weeks. The painting was nearly finished. It looked magnificent. He stopped and he chose one of his artists and he handed him the brush and he told him to finish it. Can you imagine? The student protested. You know, who was he to work with Da Vinci's work? So beautiful. And in his hesitancy, Da Vinci said to him, will not what I have done inspire you to do your best? That's a, it's not a perfect illustration, but I think it's, it's kind of getting to that idea that what God will work in the glory of the new heaven and the new earth will inspire us to serve Him and, and, and um, cultivate and fulfill that mandate that was never fulfilled. Let's move on quickly. Number five, or I think this is, I've lost count, um, life in heaven will be marked by socializing. Not spend a lot of time on this, but it is a thought worth just engaging in, isn't it? Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, 22 to 23. 
But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven to God, are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the just made man made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. In heaven, there will be socializing. Did you, did you notice this great assembly? A place of glorious company. That's what heaven will be, where the lives of saints will interact and intersect in a mutually enriching manner. In fact, there's four groups in that text. Angels, the church, the Lord himself, and Old Testament saints. The American humorist Mark Twain said, heaven for climate, hell for company. Wrong. Wrong. Heaven of her climate, heaven for company. Angels, the church, the Lord himself, and the Old Testament saints. One of the things the Bible presents is, is the joy of heaven as, as in terms of fellowship and friendship and family reunion. We will not be spending eternity as isolated individuals, but in relations and relationships. Heaven is a place of expanding friendship and fellowship. You get a, a little window into that, don't you, in um, Matthew 8, verse 11, where, where, where the disciples were said they will come and sit down with Abraham in the kingdom. What about uh, Matthew 17, 3? Moses and Elijah it says they were talking to Jesus. A little window into the life to come. There will be community without competition like Saul and David. There will be community without understanding and disagreement like Paul and Barnabas. And there will be community without disruption and failure like Paul and John Mark. Kind of touches on another question, doesn't it? Will we know each other in heaven? Well, Spurgeon said, will we be bigger fools? Of course not. We'll know each other in heaven. We will know each other in heaven more than we've ever known each other before, right? We will know as we are known, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. In fact, I think it was W. A. Crystal who said, will we know each other in heaven? We will not know each other until we get to heaven. It's a wonderful thing. I love the story that um, Erwin Lutzer tells of his father who lived to be 104. In fact, his mother lived to be 103. And they had friends who had died 10 and 20 and 30 years earlier. And I heard uh, Erwin Lutzer say this, that his dad in the last few months of his life said, you know what, son, I had better die soon or my friends in heaven will be thinking I've gone to the other place. <laughs> 10, 20, 30 years earlier, right? But what's the point? Heaven is a place where friends wait for friends. 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord will descend. The dead in Christ will rise. We which are alive and remain will be caught up together, together with the Lord in the air, and we will be with the Lord forever, forever, friends. You know, Christians never say goodbye, really. Let me squeeze these two thoughts in and we'll wrap this up. We will be singing. Heaven will be marked by singing. You're not surprised by that one. So let me just touch on it ever so briefly. But it's, it's worth noting Revelation 4 verse 8 and, and, and 11. We've got these beautiful pictures of the redeemed before the Lord singing. Uh, Worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Chapter 5, verse 9, you sang, they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Singing and praising God will be the bread and butter of our existence in the world to come. Not surprisingly, we're, we're priests before God. Revelation 1, verse 6. 
I'm going to serve Him and worship Him. If Revelation is anything to go by, heaven will be a place of uninterrupted joy, unending worship, and uninhibited praise. There's a crescendo that builds up. In the book of Revelation, Revelation 1 to 6, you've got a twofold doxology. To him be glory and dominion forever. In Revelation 4, you've got a threefold doxology. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. Revelation 5, verse 13, there's a fourfold doxology blessing, honor, glory, and power. Revelation 7, 12, a sevenfold doxology, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, and power, and might be to our God. The book of Revelation is a pretty noisy book. I don't know if you've noticed that. It resounds to the clatter of the thunderbolts of God's wrath as it's poured out in an unbelieving world. From start to finish, it echoes the sound of war, earthquakes, and demonic beasts. Yet for all the blood and thunder, I want to tell you, Revelation as a book is a hymnal. But there's a wonderful book by Robert Coleman called The Songs of Revelation. Chapter 4, verse 8, you have the anthem of the triune God. 4.11, you've got the creation hymn. 5, 9, and 10, you've got the song of redemption. 5, 12 to 14, you've got the angel's chorale. In chapter 6, verse 10, the martyr's canticle. In chapter 11, 15, the kingdom's choral. In, in Revelation 11, judgment, psalm, and so on and so forth. From Revelation 4 to the end of the book, We have a series of songs around the throne of God that highlight the unchanging reality of an eternal world in which God's purpose is unfailing, His love unending, and His reign supreme. In fact, the book ends with the hallelujah chorus. Hallelujah. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. I just buried my father-in-law in Scotland a few months ago. He's a good man, godly man, raised his family in the fear and admonition of the Lord. He was a bit of a boozer and a brawler before the Lord saved him. And in the factory, when he got saved, the word got out. And here's how it got out. Have you heard? Gordon has become a hallelujah. (laughs) That's how they described Christians back in those days in Scotland. Gordon's become a hallelujah. And that will be so more true now than ever before. My father-in-law, before the throne of God right now, is a hallelujah. And you and I will become a hallelujah. Let me finish with this. We will be seeing. We will be seeing. Let me see what I want to edit here. But here's the last thought. Revelation 22, verse 4, they will see his face. That's what we'll be doing in heaven. There's nothing boring about heaven, my friend. We will see his face. We'll savor our God. We'll drink in his mercy and his love. Once in heaven, the veil, the curtain of our unglorified humanity that is placed between us and God will be removed. All right? We, 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 we look in a mirror dimly. We, we know in part. But then, face to face, we will know as we are known, glorified, and made holy through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be able to stand joyfully in the direct presence of God unharmed. Because right now, He dwells in unapproachable light. How do I approach Him? In the righteousness of Christ. And when that final aspect of our salvation happens at our glorification, as, as Steve talked about last night, we shall see Him as He is. The cloud of unknowing will disperse. We will see the Lord Jesus Christ literally, physically. What face will you see? of God in heaven, Christ, because he has carried our humanity to the heights of the throne. And the Father and the Spirit, according to Revelation 21, verse 23, their presence will be made manifest with, with the form of light. 
that will hold us transfixed throughout all eternity. Folks, as we close, heaven will be absolutely, joyfully, and tirelessly a gazing upon the beauty of God. I have this one desire, says David, to, to dwell in the house of the Lord and behold his beauty. We will all be enthralled with the sights and sounds of heaven. We have outlined them. But God's glorious presence will be center stage. God's unfiltered presence will be the best thing about life to come. Yeah, we're going to a place. And it's going to be pleasurable. But we're really going to see a person. The joy of beholding his beauty. The thrill of measuring his mercy. The delight of comprehending his love, the mystery of weighing his ways, the satisfaction of tracing his plan, the pleasure of exalting his son. We will have an affinity with God out into infinity. Wow. We'll see him and we'll savor him. One of the hardest things about living in the United States is that June and I have been separated from our families in Northern Ireland and Scotland. Our aged parents, two who have just passed away in the last year. I have a picture of my mother by my study desk, and I often look at it, but it's not the same as seeing her. She's now with the Lord. I buried her just a year ago. Sometimes I surprised her. I was sitting in a restaurant in Orange County four days before her birthday, 80th birthday, and June said, you need to go to your mom's birthday party and surprise her. And God's goodness, we got a ticket, and off I flew, told nobody bar my brother to collect me, walked through the door, and um, almost gave her a heart attack. And I, never, never, <laughs> I didn't think about that one, okay? <laughs> you were the cause of your mother's death on the day of her birthday. Um, but, but I walk into the living room, and she got up, and it wasn't the only time she'd done it. I'll hold, try and hold back the tears. Some of the bite Irishmen and their mothers listen to Danny Boy. Um, <laughs> she got up. She always does this. Comes right over. She's small. Looks up at me. Cups her hands around my face. And she says, oh, Philip. I love you, son. Hmm. There, we, there we just stood. It's beautiful. Someday, we're going to see him. And I think Christ will, to some degree, cup his hands around our faces, kneel scarlet hands, and say, Oh, Philip, I love you, my child. And you know what the, I'll spend the rest of eternity doing? Trying to give an answer. Trying to give an answer. Face to face, With Christ my Savior, face to face, what will it be when in rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me? What a day that will be when my Jesus I will see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. What a day, what a day that will be. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen.